Johnny Cochran ran that courtroom, not Judge Ito. One man's angry perspective on the judge, the defense, and the man who walked away. O.J. Simpson said of you, I think he's a punk. <laughs> really? Plus, the truth about his relationship with Marsha Clark. Was it a romance? Barbara Walters with Christopher Darden and the case that changed his life. Then and now, Darden's verdict. With the exception of O.J. Simpson himself, perhaps the most controversial figure in that murder trial was prosecutor Christopher Darden. Here was a black lawyer prosecuting a celebrated black defendant, which infuriated many in the black community. During the trial, Christopher Darden was clearly emotional. He was angry, sometimes sullen, occasionally intransigent. And Barbara, now you can tell us what was on his mind. Well, Hugh, he's going to tell you what was on his mind. This is Christopher Darden's first interview since uh, O.J. Simpson was acquitted, and he pulls no punches. He is tough on almost everyone, and especially on himself. His new book, just published, is called In Contempt. And after you hear him, you'll understand that title. Hear now Christopher Darden's personal verdict in the trial that changed his life. Superior Court of the State of California, County of Los Angeles, in the matter of the people of the State of California versus Orenthal James Simpson. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A. He's all the jurors. How did you feel when that jury said, not guilty of the crime of murder? And as the verdict was read, uh, I just said, my God, my God. And it was like being struck in the stomach with a baseball bat. It was wrong. It was unfair. Ron and Nicole deserved better. And I felt let down. I felt let down by the system, by that jury. You write about the jury in this case, that from the first moment you saw the jury, you knew that you were in trouble. Why? What did you see in that jury? I saw anger in that jury. I got the sense that some of those jurors were opportunists. And I read their juror questionnaires. And I sensed that they weren't being honest and upfront and candid. I sensed that it was payback time. And I sensed that we, that we had no chance. From the beginning, you felt you had no chance? From the beginning, from the first day, from the, from the very moment I saw that jury, I didn't believe that we had a snowball's chance in hell of convicting O.J. Simpson. But you went through everything with a full conviction, knowing that you were not going to get a conviction? Well, I hoped. Yeah. I hoped. I mean, I hoped that they would see the light, that they would put aside whatever bias that they had, and that they would look at the evidence objectively. Why did you allow this jury, then? Why didn't you have other jurors? I went back, and I looked at some of the other juror questionnaires, the other potential jurors, and they were no better. And in many cases, they would have been worse. Are you 100% certain that O.J. Simpson committed those murders? I was 100% certain then. Nothing has occurred since then to change my mind or to alter my thinking on that point. Describe the crime photographs of the victims. They are unlike any that I had ever seen. Nicole Brown's throat is cut almost from ear to ear, and her neck is opened two or three inches, and it's opened so wide that there's debris inside her neck. There's an earring inside her neck. And she lost seven-eighths of all the blood in her body, almost a gallon and a half of blood flowed down the walkway. And Ronald Goldman, uh, his eyes open uh, when his body is first found, but multiple stab wounds. What did these crime photographs tell you about the murder and, and who did it? They told me that the motive for the killing was personal. That it was How a, did you come to that? Because of the use of a knife. Had someone, i.e., uh, Colombian drug lords, wanted to kill Nicole Brown, 
or Ronald Goldman, they wouldn't have used a knife. To murder someone with a knife is to, mur is to make the killing personal. It was as if the man that did this wanted her to know it was him and wanted her to know why he was doing it. Christopher Darden isn't easily shocked. One of eight children, he grew up in a blue-collar, working-class neighborhood in Richmond, California, a suburb of San Francisco. It's well-kept lawns disguising the fact that it is today one of the country's highest crime areas. Christopher almost flunked his first year at John F. Kennedy High School before settling down to study. He could have ended up like some he would later prosecute. You were a bad kid yourself for many years. You stole. Yeah, I'd see things that I wanted, and I'd go after those things. What kinds of things? Food, money, clothes, records, tapes, 8-track tapes. Shoplifting? Shoplifting. You were a good shoplifter? Very, very good shoplifter. When did you stop, and what made you stop? Well, in college, uh, I stole some things. I was chased by the police while trying to get away. I almost got hit by a car. I was almost killed for a pair of jeans. So that did it. That did it for me. You were very close to your older brother, Michael, but you took different paths. What went wrong with Michael? He just succumbed to some of the, uh, some of the enticements of the streets, I suppose. Uh, you know, we grew up in a time when there were lots of drugs and people were free and, or they thought they were, and people weren't real responsible. Brother Michael went on to drugs and committing burglaries eventually contracting AIDS from drugs. Another brother, Larry, became a policeman, and Christopher went to law school. There he almost wrecked his chances at finishing law school. He had a daughter, Janae, born out of wedlock, but he assumed the responsibility for her, and today at age 17, Janae is very close to her dad. Christopher's Hi, father, me. a retired welder, warned him at the start of the Simpson case, saying black folks will never convict O.J. Simpson. When he's right, he's right. And uh, when he's wrong, he's wrong. But he was right this time. His father, Eddie, and his mother, Jean, married for 44 years, did their best to instill high standards in all of their children. Was it tough for you with a family of eight kids? No, it wasn't. It was, uh, I like kids. I like to see a lot of kids sitting around eating. That, uh, I used to love that. You know? yeah, it made me feel good to know how they would take care of all of them. Did you ever think that Chris was going to become a lawyer? I did. How come? If he did something, and I say, yeah, you, you know you did it. And he say, well, do you have any proof? Do you have any evidence? You know, because if you don't have any proof, you don't have any witnesses. So you don't know if I did it or not. Are you very proud of Christopher today? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I really am very proud of Chris. He's very special. He's, he's a special young man. Even if he wasn't my son, I'd be proud of him. We went back to Christopher's old neighborhood to see his parents' house where he'd lived since he was 10. How do the neighbors treat you when you come back here now? Some people walk up to me and express pride uh, in what I've done, and others uh, shock and outrage. Some are offended that I participated in the prosecution of, uh, what's his name? Remember, you have to motivate the jury to want to come back with the verdict that you think is just under these circumstances. These days, Christopher is teaching trial advocacy at Southwestern University uh, Law School in Los Angeles. But for 14 years before this, he was in the Los Angeles County DA's office as a prosecutor. He tried 19 murder cases and never lost one until O.J. Simpson. Now at age 39, he says he no longer wants to be a prosecutor or even to practice law. And he tells it all in his just published book titled In Contempt, which strongly attacks almost everyone in the case. It's easy to see why. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, in evaluating the evidence that is presented to What do you think of the way Judge Ito handled the trial? I want to instruct... I don't think uh, uh, too highly of the way he handled the trial. Why? What did he do wrong? He gave the defense the keys to the courthouse. He yeah. surrendered his gavel, essentially. Johnny Cochran ran that courtroom, not Judge Ito. 
You write that he was overcome by the media. He loved being a celebrity, that it all got to him. Is that what happened? That did happen because it was a circus, because it was allowed to proceed in a circus-like at atmosphere, because there was no law. Uh, the law was being ignored. There was no judge. The judge allowed the case to get out of hand. It wasn't a trial. I'm a trial lawyer, not a, not a ringmaster. Should there have been cameras in that courtroom? No. No. Of course, a lot of people say, you know, it's a, look what people have learned about the justice system. I don't think it was good for the, for the uh, judicial system at all. And what people came away with was a distorted uh, view, really, of what happens in the courtroom. This stuff doesn't happen in courtrooms. This isn't a race case. Mr. Cochran wants to play the ace of spades and play the race card, but this isn't a race case. One of the major arguments between Christopher Darden and Johnny Cochran was over the use of the N-word. Cochran wanted to introduce evidence that Detective Mark Furman had used the word despite his denials. Darden was opposed. It is the filthiest, dirtiest, nastiest word in the English language. It has no place in this case or in this courtroom. But when you mention that word, it'll blind the jury. It'll blind them to the truth. His remarks are demeaning to African Americans as a group. And so I want to apologize to African Americans across this country. He apologized to African Americans on your behalf. What did you think? What did you feel when you heard that? I thought that I should probably hit him with the right cross. What he was really saying to African Americans was that I was a sellout. I was a race traitor. I was an Uncle Tom. I wasn't to be trusted. Uh, that's what he was saying. After Johnny Cochran said this about you, what happened to you? What was the reaction? People wanted to kill me. People threatened me. People spit at me. Life changed. Life changed for me drastically after Mr. Cochran apologized on my behalf. When this happened, did you think of resigning? There were days when I just didn't want to go back. And uh, desertion would probably be a better description than resignation. Pull the covers over your head. And just never get out of bed again. When we come back, the trial and errors that still haunt Christopher Darden, the fit of the glove, a witness who lied, and the truth about his private relationship with Marsha Clark. More revelations from Christopher Darden next. Well, as you've heard, from the first day of the O.J. Simpson trial, Christopher Darden believed two things, that O.J. Simpson was guilty and that the jury would never convict him. Still, he had hope. So why did the prosecution lose? Nearly six months after the trial ended, that question still gnaws at Christopher Darden. You'll see that as Barbara's interview continues. And what of his relationship with Marcia Clark? In the end, was that professional or personal? Provocative questions that Christopher Darden handles now as he does in his new book with surprising candor. You write that you are haunted by the mistakes you made. Mark Furman, do you think that the prosecution should have put him on the stand? Yeah, I do. You do? Yeah. Mark Furman is an LAPD detective. Now, he gets up on the witness stand, he takes an oath to tell the truth, and damn it, he damn well ought to tell the truth. And if he doesn't, if he doesn't, then he gives an accused murderer the keys to the jailhouse door. Marsha Clark wanted you to examine Mark Furman on the stand. You refused. Why? I had this ill feeling about Mark Furman, this inner mechanism deep down that lets you know that the man you're talking to 
He's a bigot. And that's what I said to Marsha. I said, I'm not sure whether we should put him on or not. I am sure that if we don't, the defense will call him. So maybe we should just go ahead and, and do it ourselves. But that I wouldn't put him on. I couldn't put him on. Marsha Clark yes. did put him on. And F. Lee Bailey's cross-examination of Furman would eventually prove to be devastating. Are you therefore saying that you have not used that word in the past 10 years, Detective Furman? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Screenwriter Laura McKinney was later called to the stand to play audio tapes she had recorded with Furman. On them, he used the N-word 42 times. You recognize the voice of the person who was saying they don't do anything, they don't go out there and initiate a contact. Some six foot five inch nigger has been in prison for seven years pumping weights. Who said that? Officer Mark Furman. Did that lose the case for you, those tapes? Probably. Probably. That is assuming that we ever had a chance of winning it, winning the case. Yeah, probably. How typical is Mark Furman of an LAPD? I don't think Mark Furman is typical of any kind of policeman. Is there any possibility that Mark Furman planted that glove? There is no possibility, no possibility whatsoever. And had I ever believed that there was the smallest possibility, I would have resigned from that case. How are you so certain that Mark Furman didn't plant that glove? Mark Furman didn't know whether or not O.J. Simpson was in town or whether he was in South America at the time the murders were committed. How could he? How could he? He had no opportunity to remove anything from the crime scene. And what would it mean that Mark Furman took O.J. Simpson's glove from the murder scene and took it back to O.J. Simpson's house? That would still mean O.J. Simpson is a murderer. You know, we all watch Perry Mason. We all know you don't ask a question if you don't know the answer. Was it your decision to put the glove on O.J. Simpson? It was my decision. It was my decision alone. I take responsibility for it. It was actually a brilliant move. You have the problem put, no, placing the glove on his hand. Had the, the demonstration gone better, the pundits would have said, Darton, he is a gutsy trial lawyer. What a brilliant move. But it didn't go as well as I thought it should have. But you didn't know that the glove was going to fit. Sure I did. You did? How'd you know it was going to fit? Because all the evidence at the crime scene fit O.J. Simpson. The gloves were purchased by Nicole Brown. There were photographs of him in the gloves. They were his gloves. So why shouldn't they fit his so hands? Why didn't they fit? Latex gloves. Underneath. Underneath on the one hand. Shrinkage to some degree on the other hand. And most importantly, O.J. Simpson's unwillingness to pull the gloves over his hand. After the gloves, when they didn't fit. They fit. Well, when they didn't seem to fit. They seemed to fit to me. Okay. To the jury, to the public, they didn't seem to fit. All right. How did your colleagues treat you then? With a cold shoulder, actually. They seemed to ignore me. They seemed to blame me. Your own appearance in court, um, the way you came across on television, you've been described as sullen, with a chip in your shoulder, really smiling, slightly hostile. You recognize that? Now you're smiling. Now he smiles. That was a big, bad prosecutor, growl, you know. Um, I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be there. While the trial was going on, your brother Michael was dying of AIDS, which he'd gotten from drugs. That must have been a very tough time for you, not to be able to be with him, to be at the trial. I knew, of course, that he was going to die. I thought I might be able to go home and spend time with him and my family, but the case dragged on. It just dragged on and on and on, unnecessarily. And I'd sit there some days thinking, why in the hell am I sitting here participating in this farce? and this mockery of justice, this monumental waste of time and taxpayers' dollars when I ought to be at home with my mother and my brother. Christopher, I want to talk about uh, a personal aspect in this case. 
Masha Clock, your colleague. What is she really like? Well, <laughs> it's hard to describe Marsha because Marsha is many, many things. She is extremely focused and intense on the one hand. And on the other hand, she's very soft and very gentle and a mommy. And uh, she, plays, she plays many different roles. You said she could swear like a longshoreman. Yeah, yeah, she's going to get me for that. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> it's true. There were reports that Johnny Cochran and Marsha Clark flirted with each other. You know, that they kind of played with each other. Did they? Yeah. He I came on so. to her, she came on to him? Well, I don't know if they came on to each other, mm -hmm. but the manner in which they behaved uh, toward each other, particularly in the first few months of the trial, I thought was inappropriate. Mm. You write, Marsha Clark and I were two passionate people thrown together in a trial that left us exhausted and lonely. There came a point when you and Marsha Clark were no longer just professional colleagues, but had a personal relationship. You write about it. Says who? <laughs> Said you in the book. You spent your birthdays together. You spent a weekend together in San Francisco. This is all in your book. Was it a romance? It could have been a romance, but Marsha, Clark, and I were not and did not have the kind of relationship people would like us to have had, and people have suggested that we had. Were you a little bit in love with Marsha Clark? <laughs> oh, jeez. Was I a little bit in love with Marsha Clark? I don't know. I don't know. Love is a scary thing for me, but I care about Marsha Clark. You asked if the romantic relationship could have survived. What's the relationship today? Did it survive? We are very, very close. Uh, we talk all the time. We still spend time together. Uh, we have traveled together. But assuming, arguendo, that such a relationship had ever existed, no. It, it does not anymore. It does not. The dream team, the dream team. What did you think of Robert Shapiro, who considers himself the architect of the case? I think that it is way too late, much too late, to distance himself from what eventually occurred in that courtroom. He played the race card along with the rest of them. And then objected. And then objected. What did you think of F. Lee Bailey? I thought he was a jerk. I thought his time in the courtroom had come and passed. It had come and gone. Uh, I thought he was full of himself. He was an arrogant SOB, if not worse. Did Johnny Cochran play the race card from the bottom of the deck? He played the race card from the bottom of the deck, from inside his shirt sleeve. He played it as well as anybody I have ever seen it played. Who then polices the police? You police the police. You police them by your verdict. You're the ones who send the message. Nobody else is going to do it in this society. They don't have the courage. Nobody has the courage. If you had been a member of the defense team and you were trying to get your client off, wouldn't you have used everything you could to get him off? I would not have been a member of the defense team and I would not have participated in those types of shenanigans, ever. It is unfortunate that two innocent people are dead because they got in this man's way. That's the message we wanted to deliver. And I'm the messenger. And I'm proud to have delivered it. And I thank you for your verdict in advance. In Would you have felt better about this decision had the jury deliberated four days instead of four hours? I would have felt better had the jury deliberated at all. I don't believe they did. If you believe the polls, 75% of black Americans thought Simpson was not guilty by the end of the trial. I think that regardless of whether or not some people want to believe in his guilt, history will show, history will prove it, that 75% of those people polled were wronger than him. You say that you are now no longer practice law. This case did this to you? Made you decide no longer to practice law? Something you loved? And it is something that I, uh, 
that I love. I spent almost all of my adult life in civil service, in public service, and now I've tired of that. I'd like to go on and do something else, at least for a while. Can you go home again? Are you now received by black Americans, or are they still very troubled by you? Some are troubled by me. Uh, some aren't. I think a lot of African Americans are relieved that he wasn't convicted, and that makes it easier for them to accept me. Uh, as for my going back home again, that's where I live, that's where I'm comfortable, that's where I'm going, and if anybody doesn't like it, well, tough. If you had it to do all over again, would you have taken this case? I'm not sure that I was the right man for the job. Were you not right for the job because you were black? I think that's 50% of the reason. What's 50. the other 50%? That you weren't good enough? What? Because I cared too much. Because you cared too much. How do you feel now when you hear or read that O.J. Simpson has said that Nicole bruised her own face, that the blood was planted, and that he is innocent? Well, I think it's ridiculous. I don't believe it. Recently on a radio show, O.J. Simpson said of you, I think he's a punk. <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. I wasn't the guy riding around in the back of a van crying with a gun to my head, afraid to pull the trigger. I, uh, I don't care what O.J. Simpson thinks of me. And if O.J. Simpson thinks poorly of me, you know, I have to feel like somehow I'm enhanced by that. You have remained very close to the families of Ron Goldman and Nicole Ron Simpson. Is there anything that you want to say to them? I'm sorry. I'm sorry that all of us, Marcia, me, Johnny Shapiro, Lance, I'm sorry that we failed him. We failed you, collectively. We're all a bunch of failures. Is there any lesson to have been learned from this case? I'm sure there are, and I'm not sure what all those lessons are. I think that by making this case into a race case, and that because of the injustice most people perceive as a result of the verdict, I think we're going to lose affirmative action because I think this case and this verdict has strained race relations in America. I think it's African Americans in the end who are going to suffer because of all the support we threw behind this man who has never, ever done a thing for us. I have a feeling that it's not bitterness so much as extreme forthrightness mm -hmm. that you see in that interview. He's and extremely he, candid, isn't he? Extremely. Yeah. And what he has to say has attracted an awful lot of attention now. It has, and I think a lot of what he says will continue to attract attention. He is on the cover of Newsweek mm -hmm. uh, next week. Uh, there has a movie that's been optioned. The book goes into the stores next week, and as much as you heard him say here, there's even, of course, more in the book. I think we'll be hearing a lot about this. And by the way, Robert Shapiro, whom some have called the architect of the defense, he's going to be on with us two weeks from tonight, March 29th, because he mm -hmm. has written a book. So <laughs> it'll be interesting to see what he has to say and if he is as, as forthright publishing blooms, doesn't it? O.J. Simpson trial goes on. Thank you, Barbara.